Welcome to episode 142 of the Necronama.com. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now, and uh, I, I don't know the name of the boat that got them all to Gilligan's Island. S.S. Minnow, James. What was the ship that brought them all to Gilligan's Island? The S.S. Minnow. And I'm Don Guillory, author, historian, educator, co-host of this podcast. Um, now I'm officially an award-losing author, and, right. uh, you know... You can't see my nipples, so I'm good. And I'm really trying. <laughs> <laughs> so you're an award losing author now, huh? Yes, yes. What'd you lose? Officially, I was an honorable. I guess. I guess an honorable mention isn't losing, but I mean, because you get mentioned as opposed to your name isn't even on the, you know, on the. Uh, I guess on the web page. Um, but yeah, it was the. I'm not bitter at all. I'm. I'm glad to even be included in it. But it was the Southern California uh, Book Festival. Oh, that's so cool. Like, I was like, all right. I knew some people who who've at least were on the list of, of uh, awardees and, and uh, honorable mentions. So I feel like I'm in good company. And I mean, the thing, thing I like to say is, hey, I'm out there. My name's out there. I was considered. So I'm good. There you go. Definitely. No, I mean... We, I, I joke sometimes that we're an award losing podcast because, you know, we were up for This Is Horror, uh, the best nonfiction podcast last year. And there were a lot of like, what, what were there? There were five nominees and they were all really right. great shows. And I was amazed we even got talked about. So, oh man, award losing is always good because, you know, we're still here, right? Plus, all five of the, the shows that were mentioned are all quality shows and of good quality. Oh yeah, uh, and and good content. Now, if it were something like we were compared to something, I don't know, like Goop or or uh, <laughs> uh, whatever the Joe Rogan thing is, like I'd really start to soul search as far as like, you know, maybe I should just make up some goofy bullshit as well, and uh, then I could, you know, cash out. And you know what I'm gonna do, James? You know, I thought since, that's how since, we do this show as it is. We just mix stuff well, no, up. Well, si- no, since I haven't had my three ghosts v- visit me, and the three ghosts normally visit somebody who's horrible, I kind of <laughs> question, are there ever, is there ever the opportunity that the three ghosts are really technically four, four ghosts would visit somebody and they go from being a nice person to a complete piece of shit? I mean, there has to be some balance in the system. So I guess this is my way of saying January 1, 2022, I'm going to become a black Republican or a black conservative uh, oh because... I figured, you know, they needed a new friend. All their other friends are, you know, complete fucking morons. <laughs> so, well, I guess we'll never hit a million downloads then. Oh, but uh, so we're here today to celebrate because we hit 666,666 downloads. And, you know, I've been joking about this since we began the show, that this was a huge deal and uh, and really, it's just highly entertaining to me. And the fact that we hit it this close to Christmas is really funny to me. And uh, I feel like somebody's going to be really offended by that. But oh well. Um, so I just want to quickly say thank you to everyone who's ever downloaded, listening now, listening to every single episode, like Ian Lovecraft or whatever else you've done to support us. Thank you. With that said, well, with yes. that said, I'm going to follow up since you did not get emotional this time. And I this didn't. is not this is not me saying I'm going to get emotional, but I'm just going to go ahead and throw it out there as well because the two years that well two plus years that we've been doing this, I mean, this has been uh, a, a great opportunity for us to definitely have conversations with a lot of writers, filmmakers, uh, musicians, people of all walks of life about their love of horror, about things that you know some films that we otherwise might not have watched, you know, whether they happen to be indie films or limited release films, or they happen to be, you know, probably one of the greatest horror films of all time. And we just didn't get around to it. You know, it's, 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 it's one of those things that has created a lot of opportunities and a lot of, as we both have said, uh, a lot of opportunities to have some therapy as part of this to get us through uh, COVID. And as we joked about it, you know, two years ago, or should say about 18 months ago, we're like, oh, yeah, you know, we, we'll, we'll have some fun to keep ourselves occupied during COVID. And 
here we are <laughs> going into 2022 and people uh. still haven't gotten the fucking message. So all I'm really going to say is thank you for all of you who've supported us. Thank you for all of you who've worn your masks, who've socially distanced, who've gotten your vaccinations. Those of you who can get your vaccinations, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do this in person one day, do a live show. Uh, I don't know, take it on the road, do something. Um, and then, you know, I don't know, do the show naked. I don't care. Please don't do that at the live show. So... <laughs> I know Joke's you're really on consistent you. on showing show people your nipples, before. but uh, <laughs> that's why we don't use video, everybody. He is always naked. Every single episode since we began. I know. Um, so uh, we didn't plan on this at all, but like, since you brought it up, what is like one movie that we've covered that you probably wouldn't have seen otherwise that you're thankful that you watched? Oh, God. Why would you ask me that question? Um, all right, I'll go first then. No. No, well, well, I'll still... <laughs> I'll do it, but but I would say a lot of the indie films um, I would have I would have missed, um, or I wouldn't have gotten around to, or I would really say what's more important is I wouldn't have had somebody to talk to about the films, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. So we've covered some really good ones uh, on this when when it's you know whether it's Scare Me, whether it's uh, Mortuary Collection, a lot of stuff that's on Shutter or only available on Shutter, um, and even. That that's led to things like uh, what was I saw the devil, uh, a good a oh, good yeah. deep dive into horror films from uh, from well throughout the world. I don't want to ever refer to something as a foreign film, but international films. Um, Baccarat, you know, a probably one of the best movies I've seen this past year. Yes, and that would be my number one choice to, it, to answer it, this question. It just blows me away the type of quality that's out there that we can miss. Because we get stuck in, at least in our comfort zones of, you know, we're waiting for whatever studio to release release this horror film. Or, and this is not to, to, to shit on Scream or anything else like that, or Halloween or anything like that. But you have certain films where you're kind of like, oh, I know this is definitely coming out because it's been marketed, it's been talked about. It comes out and, you're, and you enjoy it. Um, but then there are lo- other films that don't get that same level of not necessarily production, but promotion to where we end up missing them because a, a lot of these films we see because of word of mouth or at least from from emails or Twitter or anything like that to where we can go back and say, like, holy shit, this was a good call. This was a great movie, um, as opposed to we get sold on some movies as they're going to be great. We go and watch them at the theater. We watch them streaming now, and it's kind of like, wow, <laughs> what the fuck was was this that I just watched? Thankfully, it's never been anything that we've done on the show. <laughs> but we did do Chucky instead. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's that's really funny to some people. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, you, you really hit it on the head. Like, there's so many great things that I would have never watched, and even like it. Like, you know, I'm not a fan of the book and I'm not right for many reasons. I had no intention of ever watching the two it movies. And now I'm glad I did. I liked him more than I thought I would. I would have never watched him without this show. So even the bigger name stuff like there's there's a good shot. I would have skipped some of it. You know, um, you mentioned Mortuary Collection. That's still one of my top three favorite things I saw this year. I mean, there's just there's so much stuff. So. If you haven't heard all the episodes, go back and grab some. And if it's a movie you've never even heard of, just fucking listen to it. The worst that happens is we spoil the shit out of it and you don't watch it. Big deal. <laughs> With or that said, you, yeah. we spoil it, you get so in- excited about it, and you go back and watch it, and then you tell us what we missed. Absolutely. Which is even More better. More people need to do that. More people need to hit us up online and tell us why we're wrong. <laughs> Fight with me on Twitter. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, so, so let's talk Scrooge since that's why we're here. Yes. Um, this has been my favorite Christmas movie for as long as I can remember. And, and I know I constantly preach the greatness of Anna and the apocalypse, but this is still number one for me. I hadn't watched it in a few years. Mm -hmm. I sat down, I watched it and I was blown away by how good this movie still is. Right. I, I mean, I won't say it's perfect. Obviously, there's things that are going to be a little dated, but holy shit, it held up. 
And then I was reading, like, I, I didn't know anything about how, like, Bill Murray, like, walked away from Hollywood for, like, four or five years, and this was his first time back, really, and it was, like, the first time he wasn't part of an ensemble. Like, none of that mm-hmm. occurs to me. I didn't watch his movies, like, in order or anything, so I don't think about these things, right? And uh, And I don't know. He feels like such a perfect movie star in this film. Like, like this is like the epitome of Bill Murray for me. Like, do you feel that or, or I can't, like... I can't see anybody else. You know, there's, we live in this world where it's like, Oh, well you should cast so-and-so to replace this guy or, or this person pre- replace this actress. And this is one of those movies that I could not see, see it being remade despite that this is an ad- adaptation of a Christmas Carol, which has been done and redone and redone and redone. So, I mean, you're going to have, these different iterations of it, right? But I think this is the one that's that's very rewatchable uh, to the point where I, I can't remember if I was telling you this or I told my daughter this, but this is a movie that I I watched on a loop when I was younger. And I'm talking about, you know, anywhere from when it came out in 88 to, you know, I guess I, I should say when it was on HBO um, to, you know, was when I was in middle school and high school and even caught a couple of times when I was in college. It, it's something that it's a fun movie to watch, right? It's it's very deep at points when you actually go back and look at certain things. And I think, and I'm going to be biased here, I think this is the best adaptation, all respect, all respect to the Muppets. I think <laughs> this is the best adaptation of Christmas Carol, of A Christmas Carol. Um, I mean, you had, what, 145 years to do adaptations of this through, through different methods um, before this film. And I, I think they get it right by using one, the technology that's available to them in the eighties. I mean, and I mean, as far as the way that the ghosts appear, uh, the interaction that the ghosts have as far as, you know, the ghost of Christmas past is driving a, you know, he's driving a cab. Uh, the, the ghost of the Christmas future has a TV for, or at least has a monitor for a face. Uh, which adds a really cool dimension to it. Um, you know, if you were to update this for today, which it's been done on various TV shows, and I, I don't think it would need to be redone um, other than, I don't know, you, you've got some, I don't like, you take Paul Rudd, you get somebody you can't imagine being an asshole to be an asshole in a movie <laughs> and have Paul Rudd be that asshole. And he happens to be not a TV executive, but, you know, he happens to be, I don't know, uh, you know, CEO of a company or, uh, and I'll be honest. I mean, if you were to put Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, or, or any other of the, the robber barons, the modern day robber barons in this role, I don't think the ghost would have any impact. I think Jeff Bezos would look at him and say like, why the fuck are you on a break? Uh, and Elon, (laughs) Elon would, would claim some shit about like, you know, I, I built everything myself and I did this. In fact, I created you, you're the ghost. I, I, I created you. You're not a ghost of Christmas past. I actually built a time machine to go back and create you. And, you know, whatever bullshit his PR people try to claim that he does. Um, OK, but but don't you kind of want to see Donald Trump meet these three ghosts? I think that would be fucking fascinating. I would watch the shit out of that. Let me tell you one thing about Donald Trump. And I know you're trying to trap me into doing another <laughs> impression of him. Uh, he obviously would not be affected by the ghost, but he, cause it seems like he would be, he would be sitting there trying to argue with the ghost about shit that he, that happened in his past. It was like, Oh, see, here's this part where you push this kid down and this kid ended up becoming, you know, very, you know, uh, disgruntled about this. And he lost his Christmas spirit. Well, you know, the thing about it is it's not my fault. See, uh, if you look at it, you got to think about it this way. Okay. Uh, gravity Newton's laws of physics actually dropped him to the ground. I had nothing to do with that. Okay, you know, it just whatever bullshit reason he would get. I don't think the sure, ghost but, would have okay. any effect on him. He would look but at. He picture... would wake up, go for a shit on his golden toilet, and then think about how great his life is, and say like, "Oh no, I, I don't need to change anything about my life. I'm perfect." Okay, but picture at the beginning when Jeffrey Epstein shows up with the rope around his neck. Fuck. And... 
All right, let's move on. Let's move on. No, let's not move on. <laughs> no, go with it. Go with that. It. That was let's my big punchline. I'm sorry. No, no, you're not done. Let's go with it. <laughs> let's go with it. No, okay, let's get a Scrooge. Really, let's. <laughs> no, goddamn it! You're going in here with the with the Epstein and Trump. I don't. I don't have anything else. That was my whole punchline. So, Jeffrey, uh, Jeffrey, you look great. You look tremendous. Last time I saw you, I had my bodyguards putting the note. Oh shit. My bad. That's right. You hanged uh, yourself. Amazing. <laughs> so, Paid yeah, but, off the guards so they wouldn't have to. <laughs> everyone thinks it was Hillary. It's fantastic. Jesus. <laughs> so like, when you say you can't picture anybody other than Bill Murray in this role, I feel the exact same way about Bobcat. Okay. I, I'm not normally a huge Bobcat fan. Like, I think he's all right. I'm just not, not sold. And, uh, and I fucking love him in this movie. I, I think he is so great in this role. And and I feel this way about most of the cast. I can't picture anyone else in these roles. And I think if you updated it today, it would lose a lot of the charm. Adding the internet to this would just feel so shitty to me. Like there's something great force, about though. the time capsule that it's in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What what were you saying about it? Would no, I was gonna say it would it would almost be forced if if you did make it you know if you some it's like the cell phone thing and I can't remember who made the comment about you know cell phones are gonna kill horror, um, which they they didn't and they're not going to it just adds another uh, it it adds another variable, um, but I think the internet it would be too forced um, to where it's you know I don't know. The the ghost of Christmas past would be like your Facebook account or MySpace or some shit. <laughs> MySpace, like, like, that's great. Like they would they would be going through that type of stuff or your AOL account or whatever. They'd be going through all that stuff and say like, oh, see, you posted this on this day, uh, and you know you I don't know you you got into an argument with your aunt about whatever, and you oh, see man. how I would you, have a long you, list. I'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I'd have woo, you'd have a long list. <laughs> You notice I'm not on Facebook that much anymore. <laughs> so, all right, let, let's jump into this film totally. Um, you know, we we follow the same the same story. Everybody knows this story. Mm-hmm. What's great about this to me is the comedy. I have never seen a funny version of. I mean, again, aside from the Muppets, because that's a different thing. Also, I think it's funny we've mentioned the Muppets two times this week. That's hilarious to me because <laughs> uh, we talked about him in Silent Night, Deadly Night as well. Uh, and I'm still campaigning for Sam the Eagle to play the nun. But uh, <laughs> you know, aside from that, I've never seen a comedy version of this. There's there's ones that are a little more fun or have a couple jokes. But this really leaned into the comedy as well as the 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 truly dark side of what we're talking about. And I mean, I, I feel like this again, praising Bill Murray, but this just fits everything Murray does so well. It's the dark, it's the humorous, it's making fun of really terrible people. Right. And, uh, and, and I'm rewatching it this week and Congress is fucking voting to take down build back better or, build a bear or whatever the fuck it's called. And, and Congress literally like took money away from children, from kids and sick and, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, like preschool and food for kids all Christmas week. And I'm watching this film and I'm like, it's like Bill Murray knew this was happening and he was channeling it then. And I, I know the eighties weren't far off in a lot of ways, but this felt so fucking relevant to me today. Um, so I'd like to get your thoughts on that as well as how you think the 80s played into Bill's uh, oh, man. rendition of Frank Cross. Oh, here we go. <laughs> and don't get kicked off the podcast for talking about Ronald Reagan. No. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> TikTok reference. All right, go ahead. All right. So, um, Let's go over the 80s real quick. The 80s, and I and I think uh, John Cusack summed it up best in the movie Hot Tub Time Machine, where he said, this is the 80s. We had Reagan and AIDS. Let's get the fuck out of here. Um, <laughs> but there was so much overconsumption. And we, we talked about this on another episode about 
this whole idea of you had to have the right toy for your kids for Christmas. But we also had this shitty TV show, especially in retrospect. It's such a fucking horrible show because people like to say that a sex tape led to us getting the Kardashians and all their TV shows. It, it wasn't them. The TV show that led to the Kardashians ultimately was Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. Oh, because man. it it made us in the 1980s look at rich people and go like, oh, my God, look at all the cool stuff that they have. I want to be rich, too. But they're not taking into, into account all the people that get fucked over, exploited, abused as part of these people building their 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 wealth. Right. Um, so when I watched the show, I was like, oh, that's some cool shit. I mean, even as a kid, I was like, that's some cool shit that they have. I'd like some of that stuff. But um, I'm seeing a certain theme with a lot of these people that they all seem to not give a shit about anybody. Because I'm thinking, like, well, if you got all this fucking money, like, you please, like, please tell me you're taking care of somebody, you're helping people out, whatever. Um, or at least to make the people not want to eat you when the revolution comes. Like, they can at least look at you and say, like, you know what, that's Tom. He ran a soup kitchen, uh, a homeless shelter, low-income housing. He gave money back all the time. You know what? We're going to spare him because he actually he took some money to have fun with, but then he took a lot of other money and helped people with it. So we're not going to eat Tom. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> the the problem with the '80s was like there was so much of this. It, it, it was the it was the it was the me decade. Um, it was the it was the decade that was perfectly cultivated by the baby boomers. To where it's all about excess and it's all about individuality. It's all about me. I need to get whatever the fuck I want and whenever the fuck I want it. And the thing is, I didn't want it right now. I wanted it yesterday. So it needs to be given to me. So I think Frank Cross is, Frank Xavier Cross, uh, I think that he's a perfect encapsulation of the the greediness, the deceit, the, 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 uh, the pompous attitude that not just yuppies had, but people within the executive world, people within politics had to where, you know what, it doesn't matter what's going on in the real world, what's going on, you know, whether my assistant, my, my executive assistant, her husband died five years ago. I didn't fucking notice that because I'm more concerned with me, my <laughs> career and, and, and going around. It's like, yeah, I noticed she was wearing black a lot, but I thought that was a fashion trend. I love that line. <laughs> but it, it just, it just, Fully gets into the selfishness of, uh, of of all this stuff, right? But even before then, like the movie starts off, and I I entitle it because <laughs> I think they need to change the movie the the movie title. If they did update it, uh, they would have to change the movie title because the the movie title for their Christmas lineup, whatever, is called "The Night the Reindeer Died," starring Lee <laughs> Majors. And every I time I that. see it, I'm like, it's the fucking war on Christmas. And the whole idea that Santa Claus has is like, he's like, this is one Santa that's going out the front door. I'm like, Santa, what the fuck? <laughs> like all the so elves, awesome. everybody has their machine guns ready to go. Uh, but even that got into the the wackiness of the 1980s where you had, we had uh, television exposés or news exposés that were criticizing uh, the, the, the violence and sex that was on regular ass tv or even then when it was on on cable or all those extra channels that you would get like through your your local providers to where there really wasn't that much oversight um you know we had the american gladiators that was coming out in the 1980s and we had um what was that other thing uh roller derby that was coming out so there are all these questions about is all this violence necessary on television um and what you see with frank cross is He's about getting the ratings. He's about getting people to view television, which is why he's having a live production of A Christmas Carol or, or of Scrooge. They call it Scrooge on this, uh, which really makes me question some of the live performances that we've had on, you know, on TV lately, uh, where mm -hmm. it's around the holidays. And you're thinking, like, why the fuck are you having a live reenactment of different strokes or um, facts of life? Or even uh, any of these plays that are out there. Why are we doing live performances of them during this time of year? And we've been doing them like every year, it seems like, for a while. 
Like, what value does that add? Does anybody really give a shit that you're doing a show live? It's not like it used to be to where you didn't have the internet available to you to where you could see unscripted stuff or at least yeah. stuff that people weren't planning on doing. Uh, or you could see the bloopers. I mean, that, that used to be a big event, like in the 80s and 90s, if somebody was doing a live taping, I'm sorry, not live taping, a live broadcast of their show, it was like, oh, man, I can't wait for somebody to screw up or mess up. Now it's kind of like, I, I really don't give a shit about Kevin Hart and all these other people um, portraying these characters live. Okay, if they mess up, they mess up. It's not something I'm going to talk about longer than five seconds because I can go on to any number of other TV shows or websites and whatever and see the fuck ups from other people's TV shows when they, I believe they genuinely screwed up as opposed to, I kind of question whether or not this was, uh, you know, Kevin Hart forgot his line or Gabrielle Union forgot their line and then said something goofy at that moment uh, as opposed to something that was supposed to be in the script. They screwed up and it just became funny organically. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not I mean, a fan of live TV. <laughs> well, even like SNL, um, you know, there was a time Eddie Murphy would mess up. Everyone lost their minds and Murphy would be like, shut up to the crowd, you know? Right. And and now, I mean, people mess up here and there and it's funny, but like we don't talk about it. It's over like it's no. immediately like we don't remember it 10 seconds later, you know, and and that's a show that's live all the time and it's going to have that. And so we're looking for it. So you talk about something like your Kevin Hart thing, like nobody, nobody cares. Like all of that no, it, shit could be taped months ahead of time and they could say it's live and we'd be like, oh, cool. Right. And and that's the great thing about it is if you do have it to where somebody messes up and, and I, and I, and I imagine since this was supposed to be a TV show in the 1980s or TV special in the eighties, that was part of the allure of it, of we're going to do this live. Nobody else is doing a show live. We're doing it live so we can see what mess, what, what happens to mess up, which also plays into his, his story um, to where, you know, they're, they're rehearsing for a live performance. And ultimately, at the end of it, he crashes the live performance and gives his his statement about, you know, Christmas and family and, uh, you know, uh, giving back and, 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 and community and all that stuff that he's giving live as opposed to, hey, here's a taped pre-written speech I'm going to give about why I think Christmas has lost its meaning or why, you know, we need to. Uh, treat people better in this country, um, which again is is one of those things that, looking back at this film, as you said, it's it's a it's a time capsule of a movie because you're thinking about the conditions that we had in the 1980s, which the 1980s were fucking rough. No matter <laughs> yeah. how many sororities and shit and fraternities want to have their night or school spirits want to have their fucking 80s days. Sorry, we grew up in the 80s. The 80s were fucking rough. It was it was a lot more than hyper color shirts and and, you know, tight rolled pants and sideways ponytails. Uh, you had crack. You had AIDS. You had a lot of crime. You had Reagan, you know, the biggest Brown drug dealer ashtrays. in the history of the world. Yeah. yeah, everything was fucking McDonald's looked cool back then. I will give him that. Scary. Um, <laughs> McDonald's was like a little horror house. It was awesome. Uh, <laughs> Love it. Know, and, and the other thing I think we should take into account is they're giving out VCRs in this because people don't have them. So a live television broadcast, I mean, okay, so this is this is a flashback for people who are of a certain age in the 80s because so much of stuff was live or more live-ish in the 50s and 60s, right? Mm -hmm. So they have that. But then the people who are watching at, at a younger age in the eighties, they can't rewatch it. Like this is your only shot to see it as well. You know? So yeah, only if they rear it, that's the only chance you have, you know? Yeah, and, and they're and, probably not going to re air Scrooged, you know? So, right. so this is a huge deal. And I think that's something like my kids wouldn't understand today. They'd be like, just pull it up on YouTube. What are you talking about? Well, even with my kid, right, or our our kids, because our kids are, are all going through the same stuff. But I'll have a conversation with her about something. She's watching whatever it is on TV. And I'm like, oh, well, you need to go do such such. She's like, well, wait till I was like, no, no, no. you live in an era where you can pause whatever's on the TV. <laughs> like, I couldn't do that. I had I actually had to wait for the commercials. 
So, you know, go grab whatever it is from upstairs, pause the TV, go grab whatever's upstairs, come back down and then rewatch, you know, return to your show. And I've I've explained to her so many times and it's just like I'm speaking in alien language because I would tell her I could not pause the TV. She's like, why not? It's because TV didn't pause back then. And then this smart ass kid (laughs) goes for the jugular at one point and asks me. Well, was everything in black and white, too? And I'm like, go to your room. Go to your room. It's like, but every time we watch something, it shows something in the past, it's in black and white. I'm like, just go. (laughs) All the wrinkles start to form. I I feel my bones turning into dust. (laughs) But, yeah, I mean, when you bring up the technology thing, uh, that, that immediately makes me think about, well, Several things. One, having the adapters for the TV so you could get the 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 VCR to work on it. Oh man! But then, yeah. but then even then, just the the idea that you had access to a VCR meant your entertainment options changed drastically. Um, to where you know if if you had a, a VCR, whether it was VHS or Beta, you had video stores that you could go to and rent movies, and then you know. Well, shit, they were renting movies everywhere, for that matter. You didn't have a, a, a video store. But you could rent movies practically anywhere, watch them at home, invite people over, have a movie night. Um, and it really changed the way that you interacted with things. And beyond that, you also had the ability to record things off of TV. So if if I happen to miss the the live performance of Scrooge, I can set up my VCR to record it at a certain time, or at least the time that's going to be on. And we can then watch it as a family and go like, holy shit, why did this guy just all of a sudden come out and start talking to people? I bet that wasn't planned. That's weird. And then you have that, <laughs> then you have that thing recorded um, and you could show it to someone else and they could make a copy. And then, I mean, that was, that was YouTube before YouTube was a thing or before the internet was a thing was yeah. you could actually pull out, you know, a VHS um, hook up a VCR to another VCR, make a copy of of what you had. I mean, I not that I want to go back, but it's one of those things where you're like, holy shit, like <laughs> things were so damn complicated. Uh, now it's you know you can download something straight to your phone, email it to somebody, as opposed to I don't know where you would have to tether the phones together uh, so they record from each other. Man, like I mean, I'm I'm thinking about you said like we could get videos anywhere, right? Our bowling alley rented videos. Like, that's so weird to me looking back. Why the fuck was a bowling alley renting movies? That has nothing to do with each other. But, uh, <laughs> well, no, yeah, even so, beyond that, dude, this, this even opened up things in, you know, because th- I'm going to get to the nipple part. Um, <laughs> that opened up things. I bet like, you say that to all the boys. <laughs> with the, the whole idea of decency on television, right? So you had, because of the Reagan revolution and the conservative backlash from in the late seventies into the, into the 1980s, you had a lot more TV got a little bit more strict as as TV expanded and and you started getting cable television in the mid eighties. When it came to broadcast television, the rules themselves started getting a lot more strict when it came to what you could say and what you couldn't say, what type of innuendos you could make and, and how, you know, low cut a woman's dress could be. Things like that. So that whole scene where they have the network uh, standards and practices person there and they're like, she can't wear this outfit on the stage or on the show. Well, why not? You can see her nipples. And it made me think of that point, the combination between nipple gate and I mean, which then we actually have a nipple incident like 20 years after this. Um It made me think in combination with the VCRs of like how that then started to change or at least respond to this whole conservatism thing to where you had those video stores that had the room in the back that you just walked through the curtain. And if you were a certain age, you could rent or buy, you know, videos where you could definitely see someone's nipple Uh, and and the freedom that was there for a lot of people uh, to go and consume that as well, because. You know, you were treated as though you're a pariah if you if you had stuff like that. Meanwhile, you would take it home, find a blank cassette and then hook up your your other VCR to it so you could record that and then 
swap tapes with neighbors, which are some of the greatest stories I would hear about, you know, rel- male relatives of mine who were trading back and forth VHS tapes. <laughs> And then when you're a kid around like nine, 10 years old and you pop the wrong video in, you're like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Man, I remember like, like just friends going, oh man, I got, I don't know. I'm going to make something up like sorority house massacre three or something. Like you got to see the shower scene. Right. You know? And, and it was so weird even then that like, you could just, you could just hand somebody a movie that, mm-hmm. that you couldn't get anywhere else. Like my parents didn't have HBO or Cinemax or any of that kind of stuff. So this like blew my fucking mind when I was a kid, you know? And uh, I don't know. You could get a video of Michelle Pfeiffer's neck if you wanted. Whatever. It was all out there. <laughs> it's called Batman Returns. How you doing, Gemma Moore? Uh, and <laughs> but like, it's so weird to me looking back now that we just openly did this, you know, like. I don't know, like adults never questioned why we were trading movies or what they were. But I clearly remember one of my friends would be like, hey, man, do you want to borrow Goonies? And then like overly wink like he's in some really shitty sitcom. <laughs> I don't know, and this is all flooding back as you're talking, like just things oh, I see, haven't thought of this, in like 25 bring Bill years. Murray back into this because a friend of mine <laughs> gave me a video of Bill Murray, Gina Davis and uh Randy Quaid, the movie Quick Change. And apparently he recorded a video, an adult video, at the end of Quick Change. So when the movie ends, (laughs) uh, he recorded Quick Change on it and then in a, you know, and then a porn. And so he's like, oh, I got, you know, I got that, basically the same thing. I got Quick Change if you want to borrow it. And so I'm watching the credits hit and it's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, no. (laughs) So my mom like found the tape. She's like, what are you watching? I was like, I was, I was watching the movie. It wasn't this, the, you know, my friend gave me this tape. I did. I was, I was trying to watch the Bill Murray. Th- and so I told my friend, he's like, Oh, I could imagine your face when your mom, when, when, when it went from the credits to a porn, that's hilarious. And like, you just, you got me in like big trouble, dude. I, I just wanted to watch the movie. I, <laughs> I like I like Bill Murray. They were Robin Banks. He was dressed as a clown. Robin Banks. I was I was it was cool. Um, but yeah, it, it, well, you mentioned that. But that's that's even how I saw some of my first horror movies, you know, because a lot of them, if you didn't have cable mm-hmm. and if you and if you didn't have if, if you didn't go to the movie theaters to see a lot of this stuff, you got to see the movies on VHS. Um, and I remember early on it was it seemed like it was four or five months, maybe six months before you would get a, you know, a a movie that appeared on, I'm sorry, since the airing of a film or the release of a film in a movie theater uh, for it to be on uh, or at your local blockbuster or video store or bowling alley. And I just thought it was remarkable that, you know, I'm getting to see, you know, all the Friday the 13th movies that had been out to that point or uh, nightmare on Elm street. I saw on video, which is also another thing where, technology definitely played its role because it didn't do that well at the at the movie theater it got big because of of vcrs and vhs tapes uh in rental so the popularity of it from being rented so much you know pushed more movies to be made and and it's a good thing because i mean we've got how many original ones were there like seven and then they did the remake or reboot of it hopefully they don't do that again (laughs) (laughs) you know you mentioned that and that's how i saw all the friday the 13th when it started um like my my cousin would tape them for me because again Mm -hmm. i didn't have these channels that it was on and then he would give them to me and that's how i saw them all and i clearly remember being like oh there's i don't know however many five at the time or whatever right and i was like i hope they make 13 (laughs) ha 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 and now there's 12 (laughs) <laughs> and and I'm so angry about this contract dispute that seems to never end. So we can't have the 13th movie. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm just thinking about this young kid that I was who thought there'd be 13 in no time at the rate they were going. Uh, <laughs> well, at one point you were going to you were going to get that. That's right. Uh, I'll but, fucking write it. Whatever we got to do. Yeah. But even even going back to the 80s. Right. So you had a lot of the violence, a lot of sex in, in the movies and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was, what was really interesting about this movie is 
just like you have with with uh, with Scrooge in in Charles Dickens' story, you have this discussion of worker exploitation, right? And there's this one moment where uh, uh, Cross is he's pissed off, right? Well, he he, he fires Bobcat Goldway's ca- character Loudermilk, fires him for basically having an opinion that that countered his. It wasn't a bad opinion. It's like, hey, I don't think people are going to watch this because of the, it's too violent. Uh, but he's he's having this opinion of like, no, we want them scared. We want them scared to where they feel like something bad is going to happen to them if they miss it. We want them scared to, so they're sitting there watching it. And what he was doing, as far as the crazy shit that he was pulling up, was not too far removed from what the Republican Party was pulling in their campaign ads. As far as like, oh, well, you know, uh, you can't trust Dukakis. He re- he released a mass murder and rapist from prison. And uh, this guy went out and killed a, a, a woman, but not only just any woman, he killed a white woman and he's black. And we need like they pulled so many dog whistles in their ads during those election years. Then you also had the the uh, the news magazine shows like hard copy and whatever, like everything they did was sensationalized. So when I was watching this, especially that little snippet where he talks about, oh, highway, you know, highway killings and acid rain and all this acid other shit. rain. I love just, that part. And not only that, the look on his face as he's watching it, it's no <laughs> far. It, it's not far removed from what I imagine that Rupert Murdoch and uh, uh, I forgot the guy who used to head up Fox News, what they actually were probably thinking in their production meetings of like. Yeah, this Obama guy. Let's scare people because he's black. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so all the shit that you would see on Fox News, and I'm going to pick on Fox News. So if you watch Fox News unironically, um, you're not going to like this. Because all they do is sensationalize everything. And what I've seen some of their, their viewers, some of their fans will say is, oh, you know, the left is trying to run off of fear and they run this. I'm like, that is your brand. And that is projection, my friend, because what was it last week or two weeks ago that their Christmas tree caught on fire. And (laughs) before, before the fire department had put it out, they're already saying it's a hate crime. This, this is obviously someone who hates Christians and hates Christmas. This is a hate crime. We need to file charges because the tree caught on fire this is the only time you guys believe a hate crime exists or for that matter, you know, the, the, the 2016 election, all the shit that they were running around and, and, and claiming or the 2020 election, all the stuff that they were pushing and, 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 and doing. Uh, But yeah, that whole thing, it just struck me as the messaging has not changed. It's about making these people fearful. And if we've got them fearful, we got good viewers. And they're going to be loyal to us, and they're going to be afraid to go and look at, in, at what anybody else has. Uh, but yeah, as, as far as the exploitation of the workers, you know, he after he fires Loudermilk, you know, he goes off on on Gray saying like, you know, uh, yeah, I'm going to be working late. And she's like, no, I have to go to the doctor's appointment with my son. It's like I'm working late, you work late, you work late, I work late, I work late, I work late, <laughs> and it just pulled this whole thing of like not striking what what we term now as a work-life balance right? <laughs> no there is no balance it, there it's oh you got kids i don't give a shit oh well you got to take your kids to the hospital or take them to the doctor well should have thought about that before you had kids um, which again is is one of those things that that we've seen come up in some of these discussions now politically whether it happens to be um pieces of shit like joe manson or pieces of shit like mitch mcconnell It's the same type of argument, which is, well, we can't give these people money because they're poor. And if they're poor, they're going to use the money on drugs and alcohol and uh, all types of stuff. Meanwhile, I didn't see any one of them saying the same shit about Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or anybody else that they were giving billions of dollars in in, uh, tax cuts to. Because I'm pretty sure Elon had to have been high as fuck to name his child what he named his child. I'm just going out there. He has to be high as fuck for that new haircut that he has too. <laughs> you know, um, like when I look at uh, that ad that that Cross is showing them, mm-hmm. I thought it was so hilarious when I was a kid. 
And when I was rewatching it, I was like, oh, my God, this seems like something that would be made today. And listening to you say all this, I'm like, oh, <laughs> this is why I felt that way, because this is all shit that's happening all the mm-hmm. time. But I mean, I, I feel like it's uh, not necessarily the Internet, even. I think it's just how we've all gotten anything that can be sensationalized, anything that can strike that emotional reaction instead of a logical reaction anything that can just just fuck with you right but here's the difference the difference is that in 1988 bobcat looks at him and says you can't show that right and you couldn't at the time like like he wouldn't have been able to do exactly what he was doing right like even with what was happening with the republicans and everything else at that point you still couldn't show a lot of this shit on tv Because the rules were so tight. And they're still pretty tight. We're able to say pussy now because of some president. But outside of that, like, we still have a lot of these rules. And I can't help but look at how television stations aren't what they used to be. And how the internet's taken over. And how streaming and all these other things have taken over. And I think that's why. I think these rules that confine them so fucking badly are actually hurting a lot of them. Mm-hmm. And and I know like Fox and NBC aren't hurting for money by any means, but I, I do think that it affects the programming and affects ratings. And I'm not saying we should have no rules at all, but it's crazy to me that we still have a lot of the rules we have when we do have the internet and I can literally watch anything I can think of, no matter how horrific it is, right? And And I just... I can't help but wonder, like, do you think this is going to continue? Like, are we going to continue to have these stupid rules where we we try to show that we're a good Christian nation that doesn't curse and doesn't watch porn, even though everyone knows the reality around them? Do you think that's going to continue yeah. for a long time? All right. Here's here's the the unvarnished opinion of me. The statements by Donald R. Guillory are not those of the Necronomicon. Um, or any other entity. They probably are. <laughs> All right. So let's go ahead and prime that again. Start with your question, since I gave that preface, so I can immediately Bye. respond to it. <laughs> Do you think we'll continue to pretend we're a good Christian nation that doesn't break the rules? I don't know. Considering that a church brought out Kyle Rittenhouse to one of their events with full fanfare, and they had brought out Trump uh, as, I guess... Their fucking golden calf, whatever the hell they want to call it. Um, the biggest problem in this country. Now, I want to make it clear. I'm not shitting on Christianity. I'm not shitting on anybody's religion. But I am going to shit on the way that people exercise their religion or practice their religion to where it infringes upon the rights of other people. Because we have a very special brand of Christianity in America, American evangelicalism, to where it's not even about being Christian. It's about telling people that you're Christian. It's about claiming that you are. And it has nothing to do with actually anything of the the, the doctrine or, or the, the speeches, well, speeches, the doctrine or the practices of the guy that they name their religion after. Because if it were, Joel Osteen would not be in a fucking stadium to people, uh, you know, speaking to people, collecting millions of dollars or billions in some cases uh, with all these evangelists collecting billions of dollars that's untaxed. And the vast majority of the money does not go to needy organizations or if they go to organizations, they're organizations that are connected to that church so they can then get a, a, a further tax break or tax exemption on that. Um, so I, I think the, the, the con, which is, which is what all it is, the con is still going to be around there about, uh, claiming that you're about, I don't know, Christianity or whatever the hell it is when that's not what they're practicing. What they're practicing is fanaticism in some cases and God help you, no pun intended. If you go after a, a, a greasy son of a bitch like Joel Osteen or any of these other TV preachers that all they're do, doing is cash and checks and then, or whatever the fucking other uh, dipshit's name is. Um, 
the one who I guess was claiming he could cure COVID by blowing it away. Oh man, what <laughs> I is can't his remember name? his name to save my life right now. Uh, but just how all these guys are Kenneth are, Copeland. Kenneth Copeland, thank you. You know, I had he needed to Google a, it. He yeah, needed a 60 some odd million dollar plane because he didn't want to be around people. Yeah, Me too. He's... I need one of those. I mean, I'm all for a private plane, but you know what? If you're if your parishioners are walking around in shoes that have holes in them or they have cars that aren't working, you know what? You shouldn't be running around in a Bentley. I think you should be helping those people out first before you start helping yourself out. But then again, I'm not a I'm not a Christian. I'm not a politician. I just see that there's a certain way that it should be according to that doctrine, which is about helping the least of us. And they don't seem to be a, a subscribing to that belief. Um, so I'll leave it there. But I, I will. No, I'm not going to leave it there. I will say this. <laughs> there are people that are practicing what they preach. And there are people who are preying on people who are looking for some help, looking for a solution or looking for something to believe in. And they couldn't give two shits about helping those individuals who really need help. Uh, so Claire in this film, Claire is the best example of what a Christian should be, even though it's not it's not stated. There's no religious uh, uh, connection that's really made between her her call for for duty and for service. She sees it as I need to help people. So this is what I'm going to do. And she and you never see this moment where she's like, I do it because I'm a Christian. Her argument is these people need help. And I have the means to help them. So I'm going to do it. Absolutely. Which and, is why and I like Claire. I think that's that's one of the big things for me. Um, anyone who follows me on social media knows I take a lot of cheap shots at so-called Christians. And I don't I don't lump in the people that I consider to truly be living the the message that they they claim. That doesn't bother me at all. If religion works for you, wonderful. Uh, but when people just use it as a way to cash out on others or as an excuse for their actions and they think they can just go in a box and be forgiven and that makes it all okay and there's no consequences. I have an issue with that. Um, Claire is exactly what I'm looking for. If, if you're going to constantly preach to me about anything really, then then back it up. And yeah. Claire, Claire is exactly what I'm looking for. Um, you know, I've spent 25 years working in nonprofits, helping people with disabilities or human trafficking victims or whatever else. And, and that's always what I look for is who's there to truly help and who's there because it looks good on a resume. Right. Um, and, and I think that's just kind of translated into my entire life now and how I look at people and who I surround myself with. Um, I, I don't think that you have to go out of your way every single day to do a great thing, but just, just don't, don't use it as an excuse to get away with shit. That's where my line is. Yeah. And even, even with this, right. Um, if when Frank has his moment of, I guess, clarity, or he has, his, he has this moment where he actually comes around right toward the end of the film after being visited by all the ghosts, you see how he even takes it as I've got the, I've got the power and I got the platform, Right. And he even makes the joke. He's like, I'm the president of this of this network. I might not be tomorrow, but I, I got to do this now. Right. So it's not even that thing of like, hey, I'm a big, strong guy. I could do. But he, go, he goes so far as even to like have have louder milk after he makes amends with him, has louder milk go up. And he's like, hey, go up in the production box and keep, you know, keep the cameras on me because he understands how TV works. Like they're yep. going to have him out there and they may take the opportunity to remove him from or, uh, you know, take him off camera. But that moment when he's he's talking about helping people out and he says, like, hey, we're going to have a party and I want you to order and I want you to order X, X and X. And then he throws in. He's like, not the stuff I send to everybody else. You bring the stuff that I order for me <laughs> and letting him know, like, I'm paying for this. I want to do this the right way. I don't want to just do this for appearances of like, oh, yeah, I got you, you know, uh, a, a cool T-shirt or a towel or anything like that, because. You know, I had to do it. It's kind of like, no, like, I, I, I want to celebrate with these people who shouldn't be here, but, you know, send them away right now would kind of be pointless. Everybody's here. Let's have a good time. And now that I've come to this realization, <laughs> you know, we I should have done it a couple of days ago, but now I've come to this realization, 
you know, all of you are here. Let's enjoy ourselves. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's a good breakdown of, as I said earlier, worker exploitation, capitalism, or good criticism of it. Um, and this whole idea of being in constant competition, um, which which we see, I shouldn't even say constant competition, constantly chasing that brass ring is really what it is. Where you see him early on, he's, which, again, it's weird because he's the oldest looking 17 year old I've ever seen in my life. Because <laughs> <laughs> I never did the math when I was when I was watching this as a kid, because they start off in 1954 and he's, and he's four years old and then they jump up to 1968. And, you know, it's it's only 13 years later. So by math, he should be 17. Then he and Claire are living in their own apartment when he's 18. Uh, <laughs> so I'm like, all right. But anyway, each time you see him. Uh, as as an adult or adultish, so going from 1968 on, um, you see how he's just I got to do this for this job because even his, his boss or his former boss, the, the per- first person who uh, comes to visit him as a ghost, but you see him in the flashback, he's like, "Why are you, it, don't you know there's don't, can't you see there's a party going on here? Why are you working?" And you see how hard it's ingrained in him. By that bullshit that his dad pushes on him at when he's four about like you have no excuse you should be working I you know you should be working for this this and this um he he internalizes that to where he sees that that's the only way he's going to have any success any fulfillment is if he's always working so he eventually loses what's important to him because he sees an opportunity to hang out with the you know the president of the of the network which again I can't. If watching this as a kid and then watching this as an adult, I still don't fault him for that move. I fault him for what they probably didn't show afterwards, which is um, spending more time with Claire, but then you know letting his career get in the way. Because I think he could have um, had Claire stay around or at least be in his life, but I think he he just chose not to. As far as I'm going to go with work as opposed to my my life, my love. Um, so I'm going to replace that with with this. Now, I was looking at that scene and it was the one time I didn't agree with Claire. And uh, and but it was momentarily momentary uh-huh. um, in the moment. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, this is a huge opportunity for him. And your friends are going to understand, you know, or go without him, like spend the night away. That's fine. Whatever. But like. If he's doing this on Christmas Eve, Frank is obviously also already set a precedent of this happening. Right. Like you don't just dump him for this one thing. You don't say, oh, we should take a break from each other because of this one time. So Frank clearly uh, off screen has like a huge pattern of doing this. And then I was more okay with her doing it. But in the moment, I was like, what the hell, Claire? This is huge. (laughs) Like you don't want your your man to just be a dog forever, do you? You know? Yeah, because I, I even look at that and I think to myself, like if if I were in this position where I've got the ear of the the you know the the network president and he's saying come to my party, I'm not gonna say no. Because if this is what he's this is you know, the, if this is the position that he's in now, you know, where he's putting on a dog costume for a kid's show. And you have the opportunity to hang out with the, the the network president who apparently doesn't give a shit that his wife's out of town because he's like, oh, <laughs> oh, my wife is out of town. Great. Um, you can go so many different routes <laughs> with that. I love how playful that. that is, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, um, that's right. She is gone. <laughs> well, what are you doing tonight? Um, I, I just love the fact that that's just kind of understood. But it also gives us opportunity, one, to hang out with the, the, the president of the network, but then not just hang out with him, but get close enough to him to where he can shape your career. Right. So if this is one of those things, again, I can't fault him for that. But you see how he does go out. He's like, go back and get her. What's wrong with you? Which is something you're going to do in hindsight. But then you also are realizing what you would be missing. You wouldn't be in the position that you're in right now. So I think for a lot of people, that would be a hard decision, even with the, the hindsight of it. It would oh, be yeah. something that would be difficult to, 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 to turn down. Now, this is a question I had for you. I, I wrote it down okay. um, because we, you know, we skip, skipped over. It really doesn't matter. I mean, it's Charles Dickens, so everybody knows you have the, the ghost of somebody who 
you worked with or work was your partner or whatever. Uh, and then you have the ghosts of the past, uh, present and future Christmases. Um, so going into the Christmas past, my question to you is what, cause you, you definitely like Christmas a whole lot more than I do. Uh huh. What Christmas would you go back to? Uh, seven years ago. It's the best Christmas of my life. Um, before that, I, I clearly remember Christmas when I was three. I mean, I was almost four because my birthday is in February. But mm-hmm. like that that's my first like real clear memory as a child. So there must have been something spectacularly magical about that year. That'd be kind of cool to, just to see, you know. Uh, I had a year where uh, I, was, I was an only child and my parents were on the road a lot. So I didn't have a lot of steady friends, right? Um, and I had a year where my dad must have had a great year because I got, I don't even know, like 25 He-Man action figures at once. (laughs) And like, that was fucking amazing. So I remember that clearly. So if you're going like, if you're going on the, uh, the, the, uh, I want everything mode, that would be the one. But no, my, my best one was seven years ago when my daughter was born. She was born on Christmas Eve and, uh, you know, she came home for the first time on Christmas and she was due on December 13th. And being the terrible, terrible person I am, I said, hey, babe, why don't you hold her in there until Christmas and she can be our Christmas baby? Well, this came back to fucking haunt me 11 <laughs> days later. <laughs> All of a sudden, everything's my fault, you know, but <laughs> no, I, I kid. But um, yeah, I mean, that was like, that was the most magical Christmas I've ever had was my daughter being born and then bringing her home. And like, uh, my wife's grandmother was still alive at the time. So like we got a picture of like the four generations together, you know, that kind of thing. So that was really Mm -hmm. cool. Uh, It was just a great year. Uh, in answer to me liking Christmas more than you, I had like a 15 year span where Christmas was the worst time of the year for me. And it changed seven years ago. I think it changed a little bit in the years leading up to it as I started like dating my wife and going to her family for Christmas and that kind of stuff. But for a long time, I hated it more than almost anybody. And now I'm the psychotic guy who's like, can I put the tree up in August? You know, so whatever. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. What about you? Do you have one you'd go back to or like like a time you remember or? All right. Uh, See, the thing is, For those of you who don't know, if I haven't mentioned this on the show before, I'm not a Christmas person. I like, I mean, now that I'm a father, or I should say since I've I've been a father for the past seven years, um, it's it's changed within the last few years because it's, I don't look forward to getting anything. Um, I'm not concerned with getting anything for, for Christmas. For me, it's more, I want my child to have a good Christmas. Um... Because for me, I had good Christmases until I was probably like a teenager. Um, because Christmas never was like a fun time for me. Because it was always because my parents got divorced uh, when I was like nine. So for me, it was always like, whose fa- whose house am I going to go to for this Christmas? Fuck, <laughs> and then have to deal with either going someplace I don't want to be, or going someplace and like seeing my cousins and stuff. You know, I guess my answer to you would be this. Um, because of COVID, I actually lost a a cousin who was like, like really close with me. Like this, this dude would call me every birthday, like leave a message, fuck with me. Like, and, and it's one of those things where if I had the opportunity to have it, I wouldn't even say go back, but if I had the opportunity to have another Christmas with him, I would take it in a fucking heartbeat. Uh, and it doesn't matter what age, um, because every time I went to Virginia to visit family, like it, it was almost as if time never changed. Like we were always kids. So even as an adult, even when we we're in our 30s, like I would go and it was still likely we were, we were like 15, 16 years old or, or eight in some cases. So I would say if, if for anything, um, I would I would go back to one of those Christmases that I went to Virginia uh, so I could hang out with him and and 
and in Rego, and I probably have Niagara Falls moment if, if I did go back to that shit because I was I would immediately say it's like these motherfuckers couldn't wear a mask, like you had to die because somebody couldn't wear a fucking mask. Yeah. Um, so if I didn't say he died from COVID in January of this past year, uh, so yeah, it was. Whew. I don't ask me how I look at people today when they, when I see them out and about with no mask, I'm like, I want to fucking strangle you. Um, like you might not catch COVID, but you're going to catch these hands. So anyway, (laughs) you just put that on a shirt right now. You might not catch COVID, but you're going to catch these hands. I like that. I'm I'm going to red bubble right now. (laughs) But, uh, no, I, I, I think I've said this once before on the show, but I'm not positive. Um, my my experience with Christmas drastically changed when I moved away from home. Okay. Uh, that's when I stopped hating it. And that's partially weather because, you know, I first moved to California on the coast and then I moved to Arizona. So mm-hmm. Christmas is so much better than snowbound blizzards of my past. But uh, it's also just not being around people I don't want to be around, you know? And I'm not saying I don't miss any family members, but... I do appreciate having holidays where I don't have to deal with all of them. And I think that it massively changed my outlook. So well, things you know, became more other, positive. The other reason why I would say it, it, it didn't work for me for the longest time, uh, Christmas itself, was because once I was in high school, I would say about a junior in high school, that was when it was one of those things of, um, which this is no secret, like I did not like my dad for like the longest time. Um, and even now we have like hot and cold, really like we have our good moments and we have our moments like, eh, I'm not going to talk to you for about a month, but not nothing malicious as far as like, fuck you. I'm not going to talk to you. Um, so when I was in high school and even going into college, I knew if I was working, I didn't have to go visit. So I got whatever fucking job it was to work for the holidays. And it's like, well, can't come visit. I'm working. I'm on the schedule. I got to work. And because it was like, I don't want to go there and hear about what I'm doing wrong or hear about like, you know, any number of things about like, oh, here's what's wrong with your mom. And like, I don't want to hear any like I'm 15, 16 years old. I don't give a shit. Like none of that applies to me. Um, But so I started working retail. I started working customer service and stuff like that for for for, you know, uh, my junior year in high school on. And going into college. So like Christmas for me, the Christmas season, it stopped having meaning at that point because it was it was more about I'm working and then sometimes having to deal with shitty people around that time period. Uh, So kind of like at least some of the films that we've watched and discussed lately, it was that same thing of like, oh, people forgot what Christmas is about. I tell you right now, anybody who's in retail They've seen the worst of people during what's supposed to be the nicest, you know, when everybody's supposed to be the nicest to each other. They've seen the absolute worst in people. Um, So for any of you who are working retail, if you hear this, like some of us get it, some of us understand. And and we try to not make your life uh, horrific during that time period. Like, I don't even like going out during this time because I'm like, you guys are overworked as fuck right now. Like. I don't need to come in here and get like two little items to to clog up the line and, and make your day even longer. Um, so yeah, for the, for the longest time up until um, up until you know like within the last seven years, seven eight years, uh, it, it's kind of been the same for me. I was like, it's gotten to the point where I want my kid to enjoy the Christmas season. You know, whether whether that's dealing with food or or waiting for Santa Claus or, or what, you know, we've, we've turned to watching, uh, Christmas movies like every other day, uh, whether it was ones that I picked ones that she picked, whether it was like shitty picks where it's like, Oh, here's this random ass Christmas movie. Let's check this out. Five minutes into it. Nope. I guess we'll cancel movie night. (laughs) (laughs) Not going to say what movie it was, but it was like, good God, this is bad. Um, I'm going to need to know later. Anyway, um, I don't think you'll like my answer. (laughs) Oh, well, I know it wasn't Anna, so it's okay. Um, so, so the ghost of Christmas present shows up. How does your year this year look like, like what's, what's, I think the sign different or special about this year. The sign that she had was appropriate. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's the ball breaker suite where it's like, you know, hey, we were in the same position last year as we are in this year, uh, which is people just still can't get their shit together uh, for simple stuff. But I mean, it, it, as far as like family and stuff, for me, like things are good. You know, everybody's healthy, at least in my household, everybody's healthy. Nobody's um, nobody's contracted COVID, at least to, as far as we know, no one's contracted it. Um, so, again, everybody in my household is safe and healthy. Uh, so that's all that matters to me. And and it's, it's kind of the it kind of goes with the same thing that, you know, when my wife or my daughter asked me what I want for Christmas, I always tell them, like, I don't want anything like you guys are safe. You guys are healthy. That's all I want. That's that's all I could ask for. I said any material shit I can go buy. I really don't care about getting material stuff from you guys. I just want you to be safe. I want you to be healthy. Um, I don't want any crazy shit to happen to to either one of you. Because if it does, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to say what would happen, but it it would not be it would not be a good situation. Yeah, we canceled all of our travel plans and everything else because of you know everything look around and uh i mean we didn't even actually actually make the travel plans like we knew we had to not do it you cancel the possibilities of it that's that's really what it is yeah um but outside of that man like i don't know i feel like it'll be a decent year and i hope it is for all of our listeners as well but let's get back to uh to scrooged and and the ghost of christmas present because she's my favorite part of this whole film i love her (laughs) <laughs> and I literally, I told you this, but I literally cannot make toast without saying it's a toaster. <laughs> it's to the point that my wife will make toast to not hear me say it because we've been together for too long. <laughs> like, that's how much this this character influenced my life. But, like, no matter how down I am and depressed I am or whatever else... If I watch these scenes with her, like I'll pull them up on YouTube just to fucking laugh. Like it never gets old. I love this character. I can't imagine anyone else playing her. And there's something so great about how violent she is to him because he does deserve it. (laughs) Oh, he most definitely does. I mean, that one line of like, sometimes you got to smack people in the face to wake them up. Mm -hmm. My daughter was furious because this. Because I mean, because of the juxtaposition, because you've got Carol Kane, who is always like a sweet, wonderful person in everything that she's in. Uh, I, I can't recall anything I've seen where she was a mean person. Right. You know, she's been neurotic. She's been a little bit unhinged, but she's never been like, I'm just going to beat the shit out of somebody. Um, so she sees this. I mean, she refers to her as, as a fairy. She sees, you know, a, as opposed to the ghost of Christmas present. She's like, mm-hmm. Daddy, why is that fairy just beating him up? I was like, he deserves it. <laughs> and like before I could fully get he deserves it out, she says that line of like, sometimes you got to smack people in the face to wake them up. And again, she starts getting mad. She's like, but she shouldn't be. I was like, but he's he's been really bad. Like she's she's trying to let him know, like, you know, he, he's being a bad person. So he, something needs to be be done. So that's the only way she can get, she can reach out to him, um, which, again, was funny uh, from an adult perspective when you're sitting there like, God damn, I, I, there are so many times when I wish somebody had slapped me around to wake me the fuck up. Um, but they definitely weren't just showing up in, uh, you know, in with their their wings in a in a tutu. And I'm in no way telling people that they should smack people to wake them up in the real world. But I am saying it's some pretty good advice if you ever need it. Oh, it most definitely is. <laughs> um, one, one thing I love about Frank here, I love that it doesn't take much to break him. Mm-hmm. Like as soon as he sees his mom, he, oh, he's not instantly Niagara crying. Niagara Falls. He's not quite crying yet, but he he feels it and you see it. And I love that there isn't a harsh arc to make him change. Like it's literally just, he has to stop and look at something. And, and I think it's great how that happens in every level on this, because in, in the original Christmas Carol, like Scrooge really has to work to finally fear what's coming. 
And Frank doesn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. Frank is instantly like, oh, shit, there's my mom. That's the thing I cared about. There's my dad. I cared about him. Uh, there's the veal. Do you know the prices? You know, and then he gets to, to the four present, pounds of veal. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. But uh, and then he then he sees his brother in the present, you know, and you can tell he's actually affected by it. And he's trying so hard not to be. And I love that vulnerability of his character. And I love that they didn't have to work to get it out of him. It's literally just making him pause and look at his life. And I thought that was way more powerful than having to change him. Um, yeah. And then, then of course, we get to the future, and he doesn't even like put up a fight. He's just like, "Ah, crap! We can't keep doing this. I'm going to change that, and I'm going to change this." And you know, like it's not well, like not even, where he well, had to fear before, it all. Even before he gets to that point, right? He's completely. Well, we have a couple of fake outs that that take place, right? Yeah. So there's the whole he's trying to get away from that asshole producer. And there's the that's the guy from yeah. Gremlins too, causing yeah. problems again. <laughs> and in the mouth of madness. You know, and, he gets uh, on the elevator and then he freaks out because he, and like you said, he immediately starts bargaining. He's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do it. Okay, I don't want to get in the elevator. So you see how he immediately breaks down because he's like, he's already been, you know, literally and figuratively beaten down. Um but he's immediately like submitting to it, and then it's revealed like, oh no, this is this is the guy. He's playing the Ghost of Christmas Future, and he's like, oh yeah, you're going places, man. That was really <laughs> convincing. And you know, Louder Milk comes back, and right before that, we have this great moment, a great horror moment, where the Ghost of Christmas Future is reaching through the television yes. screen, television monitors behind him, and every because time we know I that's this, coming, yeah, yeah. Every time I see it, I forget that he doesn't get him at that point. I'm so convinced, again, watching this movie again, I'm like, he's going to mm -hmm. fucking grab him. This is going to be, oh, shit, that's right. Louder Milk comes in and he shoots, you know, shoots through the door. Um, but even then, it, it's so well done that you have this great bridge between comedy and horror to when he does get on the elevator escaping Louder Milk that... Ghost of Christmas Future is there. He immediately thinks it's the guy from downstairs. Hears the noises, opens up the robe, sees all the screaming souls inside of him. He does a a a quintessential Bill Murray thing where it's like he looks at it, steps back, opens it again, looks, and he's like, "Yeah, oh, fuck." <laughs> like we're gonna yeah. get phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, when I was 11, that part scared the shit out of me. And and I'm looking at it now, you know, at 43, and I'm like, that's still a pretty great look. Like, I really oh, like yeah. the design of it and stuff. Like, I don't know why I was scared shitless of it at 11, but whatever. But, man, that, that part really, I really dig what they did with that. Well, because, well, one, you're talking about a 1980s movie. You know, this is, I guess, filmed in 87, released in 88. You're talking about, you know, a practical effect, which you look at it now with, you know, I guess remastering and and and, and HD and everything like that. You can pick some of the stuff apart, right? It definitely sure. looks like definitely looks more like Muppets. Hey, there's another reference. Definitely looks more <laughs> like Muppets than it does like actual people on the inside. But even then, it's still one of those things where you're like, that was fucking cool. That was that was that was a that was a cool thing. To where if they wanted to correct this to not even have to worry about people looking at it and things like that, it could be he opens it and you just see it from the side where he opens the, the robe. You hear all the screaming and moaning and stuff. He closes it, but you never see what's in there. And you have that mystery of like, oh, something really fucked up must be going on inside of that the, the, the ghost of Christmas future's body. But then okay. they couldn't sing at the end. <laughs> no, but they, they you could still have them at the end singing and you're kind of like, oh, OK, <laughs> I get it. You can still have that. I think you can still have it. But there were a couple of things that we, we skipped over, which I don't want to skip over or don't want to leave off because I think they were great. They're timely jokes. They're dated jokes. But they work so well because at my age, when I watched as a kid, I didn't get the joke. But as an adult. The joke is funny as shit. It's a little fucked up, but it's funny. 
So there's that part where, you know, he's already freaked out by the ghost coming to visit him because, you know, the um, the former director of the network, former president of the network says, oh, you're going to be visited by a ghost. It's going to be at 12, blah, blah, blah. And he starts freaking out and he starts thinking like, oh, the the uh, the producer is 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 there or they're trying to pull a scam on him. And the ghost themselves, or at least the ghost starts playing tricks on him to make him start seeing things. And. You see that he starts, you know, calling out the stuff in the restaurant. He's like, ah, ah, no, sir, that's a baked Alaska. That's a dessert. You don't want that. And he starts pointing, ah, ah, <laughs> no, sir. Uh, actually, you know, that has to be prepared over a couple of days. You have to order it in advance. And it just plays into the total obliviousness that everybody else has to him uh, about what's going on and what he's seeing, you know, starting with the eyeball in his highball glass. Um and I totally miss that. That's great. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll have a highball. Uh, but then he sees the, you know, one of the, the waiters that's on fire. He goes over, grabs the bucket with some ice <laughs> and some water in it and throws it on him and says this one line that's going to go over so many people's heads. I mean, many years later, it's like, oh, I thought you were Richard Pryor. I, I laughed so hard at that. I laugh. My kid had no idea, but I couldn't tell him like, yeah, it's based off when Richard Pryor set himself on fire because he was freebasing cocaine and you know, he ran down the street naked and on fire, which you is know, a really great fast, story. Yeah, that that stand up that Richard did with the match. Where he oh lights the match God. and he's like, what's this? And he moves the match a little bit and he's like, Richard Pryor running down the street. <laughs> like, I heard all your jokes, motherfuckers. <laughs> And the thing is, that's great about it is Richard Pryor was the first one to really make fun of what happened to him. I mean, going so far as to talk about like, yeah, I was in the hospital and the news said I was dead. And I'm like, mm -mm, I, I'm fully bandaged up. I'm like, mm -mm, mm -mm, I'm alive. Get me out of here. <laughs> it's like, Do you know how fucked up it is to watch the news and they say that you, you're dead? It's like at that moment, I'm like, I'm not doing drugs. I'm not doing shit else when I get out of this motherfucker. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's even then, uh, uh, like even Carol Kane's character, again, as an adult, me has completely different meaning. When Frank starts trying to fight back or talking about fighting back, she's like, oh, yeah, I like the rough stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's so funny. Like, why are you laughing, Daddy? I'm like, oh, you, you'll get it when you get older. Or probably the best line out of this movie with cr the, the Ghost of Christmas Present, where she takes him into the sewers after he had already been to the shelter and 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 kind of blown off the the homeless people that were there and then told Claire that horrible line of scrape them off, uh, you know, because they're, they're basically the shit under your shoe. They're trash. They're garbage. They're a waste of your time. That... He then has to come to come to grips or come to terms and face to face with one of the homeless people that couldn't find a place to stay because Frank didn't give him two dollars, couldn't find a place to stay and ended up freezing in the sewers. But the great line before he even gets there is, you know, because the, the the ghost of Christmas present takes him down there or leaves him down there. And he looks around and says, oh, this is nice. Where are we? Trump Tower? I laughed and my kid, my kid, without skipping a beat, she she was like, how does he know about Trump? Because she uh, she knows it's an old movie, but she's like, how does he know about Trump? I said, but babe, um, people have known about Trump for a long time. It's just that a lot of people did not pay attention to all the warning signs. And then she she asked the question kind of like you brought up earlier. She said, I think the ghosts need to go visit Trump. And I responded with, <laughs> I don't think he would pay attention. I love that girl. Yeah. <laughs> she, That's hilarious. I didn't know that for our listeners when I brought it up. That's really funny. Oh, it me. was it was great because <laughs> I think I think he should go visit the, the ghost should go visit Trump. I said uh, the, I said definitely the ghost of present uh Christmas present should visit him. <laughs> Knock him around. The, yeah. Right. Uh, I think one of the most interesting aspects of this film to me is something that nobody even talks about during it. Mm -hmm. And it's that as far as I know, he's the only version of Ebenezer Scrooge that knows the story of Ebenezer Scrooge. 
Okay. And I think that that's such an interesting aspect to his character because once it starts, he knows it's inevitable. He knows where the ghost of the future goes, right? Mm-hmm. Like he knows what to, what he thinks he should expect. And I really feel that that's what uh, pushes this, this character arc so much faster than like Scrooge dealing with it and changing as it goes. I think he's like, oh shit, this is where it's heading. Right. And, and then he's getting hit with these things that actually pierce his armor and, and make him feel vulnerable. And I really feel like that's a big reason that he changes faster. And, and I don't want like, oh, I know the story. I know what's coming. I just think it's a great way to really add another dimension to this character. And then, uh, I think it's weird that Claire's still totally free and and she's like, yeah, cool, let's date again twenty years later. Awesome. It's really well, here's what I well, even <laughs> even more strange than that is again, you pay attention to stuff a different way when you've seen seen it before or when you see it as an adult. He immediately goes to the shelter, sees her like when she sees him sitting there, he jumps up with the you know throws the blanket off and kisses her on the lips, and I'm like, but she kisses him back. So I immediately think like. They haven't seen each other in 15 years, haven't talked to each other in 15 years. And the ghost called the number. He didn't even know what her number was. Yeah. So <laughs> just, you know, just the way that that all worked out. I was like, OK, you can you can pull in that they still have feelings for each other because he didn't get he didn't find anybody. She didn't find anybody. And, you know, every now and then that does happen where maybe they dated somebody, but there was nobody who was who was willing to stick around because maybe Claire had some suitors or some people that were kind of like, yeah, I'm really cool. And I'm really into you, but you're too, you're too into this helping homeless people thing. Um, mm-hmm. So, which, which may have happened. And she just looks at it and like, I'm not going to give up what I want to do in life by helping people, you know, for, for a tryst, for, 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 for a fling or anything like that, mm-hmm. which I can understand. I mean, there, there are people who are completely committed to, uh, to their jobs, to to you know whatever their their volunteerism is, which again is a, another great line that's delivered, which is it's like yeah they're volunteers because nobody's willing to pay them. Uh, <laughs> again, it was it was funny, but then it was kind of it was so wrong because you look at it and you're like, that's kind of the point of being a volunteer. It's because you're willing to do something, provide a service or somebody that that is needed. But there's not the financial incentive behind it. There's not the financial calling for it because you understand a lot of these these nonprofits, a lot of these charities don't have the overhead to pay a lot of staff, um, as opposed to some of the organizations that we already mentioned that definitely have the money and um, they're not doing anything with it. And they're definitely not paying a lot of people top dollar to do stuff. Yeah, Um, I see it all the time in the nonprofit sector, you know, Uh, I also see a lot of let's fund prisons and not mental health or things right. like that. And I think a lot of that plays into this. Um, I think it's interesting how, in a way, Claire has done exactly what Frank has done, except she does it for a very different reason. This thing controls her life. It's where she puts all of her energy. It's the thing she believes in. And and I think that that... Um, makes me understand their attraction to one another more. They're very yin and yang, right? Mm -hmm. But they're also very similar in those regards of what's important to me is number one. And, uh, and normally I would nitpick this and be like, Oh, it's ridiculous that she takes him back instantly. And, and it's crazy that one moment he's yelling that he'd buy a bride. And the next I'm supposed to believe he's in love but this is one of my favorite movies, so I'm going easy on it instead. And <laughs> but I, I do think that those aspects of the characters help explain how this happens. I also think we have a lot of supernatural shit going on, so there's probably yeah. a lot of help as well. Um, but let me let me jump to the end here and ask you: Do you think Frank stays this way? Do you think mm. he's truly changed or do you think Frank Cross a year later is back to being Frank Cross? It's it's like when we talk about the purge. 
Like you have the purge, but we never have this exploration until the last film that 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 came out. There's never this exploration of what happens the day after or the week after or anything like that. Um, and that's always been my question with any of the the uh, the iterations or adaptations of A Christmas Carol is how long do these people stay changed or affected? I think, or at least I want to think, that Frank changes because it, now he might revert in some ways as far as like he might be a, more, a little bit more bullheaded about certain things. Um, but I think this idea of being able to witness like the fact that he lost so much because of what he had done and so many other people were affected by his decisions. Um, I think he changes to an extent. He, he probably eventually finds some balance uh, between his, his previous self and his, and his new self. Um, but I, I want to think that he does change for good. Uh, because there are a lot of these people who do have these conversions that take place where, you know, it's it's something that they experienced, something that was brought to their attention, and they decided that they would never go back to that. I mean, you look at it with, with we mentioned uh, jokingly about Richard Pryor, but there are people uh, who go through addiction and they they have their moments and they you have people who never go back. Uh, mm -hmm. Same thing with people who might have been living in a life of crime or people who uh, had lived a life of privilege, right? They understand what else is out there and what they could be doing for people. Um, so in, in a lot of cases, you do have people like that. I mean, you have people who were completely shitty people but turned their lives around for the better. I mean, and I'm talking about you have people who were like Klan members and neo-Nazis that are kind of like they, they eventually get exposed to something that changes their perspective and they stay that way. They become advocates. They become accomplices for uh, groups and organizations that they otherwise would have been, you know, uh, marginalizing or victimizing. So I think it's possible. I, I want to think that he does. Um, and eh, that, I'm just going to leave it there. I, I, I want to hope that he does. I think as long as Claire's in his life, he does. I, I yeah, think, without uh, a doubt. I think if that falls apart again... I don't know, but I also can't help but wonder, did Frank Cross go to jail? Like you sent a guy with a gun to hold a lot of people hostage, man. <laughs> I don't know. Here's how you get out of that. It was all part of the show. And then They're the done. network pays those people a lot of money to bury it. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah. Who's going to call uh, the police? Who's going to do an investigation? <laughs> all it would, all it would come down to is, uh, creating a a, a a a dangerous workplace, right? Because Loudermilk doesn't shoot anybody, right? He shoots a wall or shoots a TV monitor or something, right? Yeah, does some property damage, yeah. So it it then becomes an issue of oh he fired a he fired a gun inside of the building. He didn't know, you know, we didn't tell everybody because we wanted to be a surprise and. Uh, we, we took measures to make sure that no one was going to get hurt because no one gets hurt. So they can, they can always rest on that. Uh, and, and with as much money as that studio probably has, I guarantee you they can easily cover it up and say like, Oh yeah, you know, it was, it was part of the show. That's why Frank went down there and was talking and everything. Um, yay Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My final question for you. Do you think the future of TV involves cats watching things. God damn it. I wrote this down. <laughs> I fucking wrote this down because it was not I couldn't too, resist. It was not too long ago. And I don't know if it still exists. It might, but there was a TV channel that was specifically dedicated to dogs. Yeah. Did James. your dog watch it? No, no. I did, you had to pay for it, man. I wasn't going to pay five ninety nine a month for a dog channel. Um, I, I, I do it the normal way. I leave the TV on to a familiar program so that when I'm not home or if I'm gone for an extended period during the day, my dog is calm. So my ex-girlfriend watched Animal Planet all the time and my cat would sit and watch it. So I kind of believe that this could be a thing, but I'm still weirded out by it. As you should be. <laughs> Did you have anything in your notes that we did not hit? Uh, 
No, it, I mean, really, anything else that would have come up, it's it's stuff that we already mentioned as far as this, this whole idea of what Christmas is supposed to mean versus what it does mean and how people have kind of fucked it over. Um, no. Cool. All right. Well, then, I suppose we will jump into movie recommendations. Um, I'm going to go with my my double feature nonsense. And uh, I don't really know on this one. There's so many things that I feel kind of go with it and kind of don't. And uh, and so I was reading about it a bit and I read about some of the marketing and how they tried to tie it into Ghostbusters. <laughs> and this just makes me want Ghostbusters to be the double feature. God but like some it. of the I marketing, <laughs> some of the marketing was literally like he's still with ghosts, but now it's three against one <laughs> like shit like that. And I find that so funny. So, so that's my double feature. Ghostbusters and Scrooged. All right. Oh Give All me right. your 666,666 movie choices. Point six. All right. So oh. <laughs> uh, I mentioned Muppet Christmas Carol. So I'm going to leave that one up there. Uh, Die Hard. I'm going to throw in Beetlejuice. Is that a Christmas? I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Yeah. Let's not. Let's not. Oh, start Beetlejuice again. would be so fun with this. Yeah. Especially the way that the music is the Chris, the way the Christmas music sounds in this film. Actually, you know what? Uh, I found some interesting trivia about it is that. This movie lost the Oscar for best makeup to Beetlejuice. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so they were up, both up for it. Uh, Jumanji. Um, and that could be the original. It could be the 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 new ones. Uh, the Grinch. And I would say the one with Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, let's see. As far as other horror films, the people under the stairs, when you're talking about exploitation and, and class and things like that. Or the utter campiness and goofiness, Transylvania 65,000. You mentioned They Live jokingly, but I actually had it on my list. And a movie that definitely gets into that whole idea of, is this what Christmas has come to? Uh, Jingle All the Way. Nice. That's the one where Sinbad goes to jail. <laughs> yeah. See, he goes to jail. <laughs> it's so fun knowing how to push your buttons. Uh... <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that pretty much brings us to a close. So again, thank you everybody for, for listening to the show and getting us to the almighty six, 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 six downloads. Cause I don't know. It's just been a lot of fun for me to pretend that it mattered. And, uh, I hope everybody has a great holiday season, whether you celebrate something or not. Don, what do you got for everybody before we go? Um, I'm just going to say Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Saturnalia, Happy Yule, Happy Hanukkah, uh, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Festivus, a holiday for the rest of us, um, Happy Jewish Christmas. And I don't mean Hanukkah, as some people would probably think. I mean actual Jewish Christmas, uh, which is having Chinese food on Christmas Day. Um, which is a, a great tradition that that shows how culture is mixed together uh, after being marginalized and, and relying on one another. So cooperation. Um, what I will say is is going into the new year is aside from, you know, taking care of each other, definitely think about what you've learned over the past year or two. Um, and kind of like this movie, it's never too late to change. Uh, it's never too late to and I don't mean as far as like you're a horrible person and you need to change. I <laughs> you mean might as far be. as like we don't know. It's who's never listening. it's never too late to change your perspective on things. It's never too late to change, uh, you know, what you want to do in life. The only time it's too late is when you're dead. So uh, I would just say that do what you can with this 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 chance that you have, uh, and going into the new year, you know, definitely uh, try to make this next year even better than this past one. Uh, and we'll just ignore all of 2020 because Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> but other than exactly. that, um, you know, I'll just I'll when we start the Patreon, I'll start showing my nipples. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I guess what we're trying to say is all holidays matter. That wraps it up for another week. As always, I am James Sabata. And I am Richard Burton. That's right. 
And on Monday, we'll be back with Krampus. So make sure you check it out here at the Necronama.com.